Welcome to Locked On Horn Frogs. Your TCU Horn Frogs are five and zero. Oh. They defeated Kansas thirty eight to thirty one in a thrilling football game on Saturday. And Matt, um, it wasn't necessarily like I don't know what your expectations were. I felt like towards the end of the week, I thought, okay, I think this is a game where TCU could pull away and end up winning by a couple scores. You know, it'll be competitive, but it won't necessarily be a heart stopper. Um, but it was a back and forth affair and. You know, one th- the thing I want to start off with is it's really the first time. I guess you could say the first half of the Colorado game would fall in this category too, but this felt more real. Uh, it's the first time in the Sunny Dykes era where the team faced some like real adversity down 17 10 midway through the third quarter. Uh, Jason Bean, the backup quarterback, had come in for KU. He was slinging it around, seemed like everything was going Kansas's way. And Darius Davis was able to score on a weird touchdown play and then they just never really looked back and and found a way to win so I was impressed by how they sort of dug deep and got it done what were your thoughts on um getting a kind of gutsy tough-minded victory on the road for the first time in this new regime I was I was hesitant because of all the talk that I saw, especially later on in the week, as I, I think everyone started talking themselves into like, oh yeah, like this can, they can make a statement by winning this game by a lot. And I think we were just kind of projecting what we saw from TCU against a bad Oklahoma team forward a little bit um, and expecting that that was just going to be the norm or that they were going to be, or that, or like insinuating that Kansas wasn't actually good. Kansas is a really good team. And, and we all just need to, get used to living in, in a world where Lance Leipold's doing stuff, man. And they, they're a good team and they're going to finish in the top half of the league standings. I don't know where, but they absolutely showed enough on Saturday that they're like, Oh, like they can, they can make some noise and they can infuriate some people down the stretch. So I, so all that to say, I was hesitant when people started like projecting this as like a 14, 17, 21 point win. I'm like, I don't feel great about that. And so then of course I felt some type of way but I agree I do think that it says a lot like they got down 17 10 and then they outscored Kansas 28 to 14 down the stretch that's big and they adjusted I think um there were a lot of things about that game that were that like probably didn't go according to script especially like you game plan for one quarterback all week and then suddenly you're having to adjust to playing a different quarterback on the fly and we can talk about that here in a little bit I think I was, I was impressed by how they adjusted, how they handled by how they rebounded to your point facing their first, I think their first like true quality opponent this season. Um, Cause Colorado's bad. Tarleton's an FCS team. SMU seems like they're really trying to kind of find their way in year one or at Lashley and Oklahoma is bad. Like this was their first, this is super weird to say, but we in game five, their first like game against a true quality opponent was against Kansas and they, and they got out of it with a win. They got a win on the road. That's, that's what you want. So uh, we've discussed Quentin Johnston at length this year. And we're so dumb. We're yeah, so dumb. Well, we are. And we kind of came to the conclusion last week. We're like, okay, this is weird. I mean, it's not necessarily bad. It's just strange. They haven't found ways to give him the football. Well, hello. Welcome to the party, Q. Uh, appreciate you, you know, showing up and showing out. 14 catches for 206 yards. And, I mean, that by itself is, like, a pretty jaw-dropping stat line. But TC only had 23 receptions on Saturday. So he had 14 of their 23 catches. They had 308 yards through the air. So he accounted for, you know, two-thirds of that total, essentially, and had a huge touchdown catch with a defender draped all over him to give them the lead. Um, Matt, I mean, this was this was great to see him kind of step up into that number one wide receiver role. What did you see as far as them finding ways to get him the football? And it's really the first time this year we've seen like a true number one wide out from TCU uh, this season. The thing that stood out to me, there were a few things. One of them being, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, the fact that like they weren't really utilizing him in the ways that we thought they were going to in the uh, in preseason, right? Where they said in the all season, like, oh, we're he's not going to just be a jump ball guy. He's going to, we're going to get him the ball in space in the middle of the field and let him work. And they actually did that. And and I 
one of the examples of that was on that 99 yard touchdown drive in the first half. And he catches like an over route and just like spins out of a defender's tackle and just runs like gets like, <laughs> as an aside, he was running angry. Like he was getting like angry yards after the catch. And it was really fun to watch him play that way. And so getting, seeing them get him involved with that, getting, like getting him the ball in the sweeps a couple of times, like they've been doing, giving him some jump ball opportunities. And then uh, obviously had the game winning touchdown on like that sort of like, I guess it was kind of like a corner route um, mm-hmm. or, or kind of a, a fade, but it's from the seam and just did a great job. So um, really impressed by um, just his effort and just like his game being at a completely different level in this game. I think it helps that Kansas, um, like on that route I was talking about a minute ago, like on the 99 yard, 99 yard drive, they just chose not to cover him in instances, which is a, is, is a great strategy. If you're TCU, I don't know why anyone would ever choose to do that. Um, but and I don't think they were double covering him and bracketing him as much as some other teams were, which I think was really helpful for him. Um, and I think, um, Steven, I think you paid more attention to the, uh, to the post game comments than I did. Um, I feel like there was an implication maybe that he hadn't like from Sonny that maybe he hadn't been healthy and that might've been playing into this too. Yeah. He, he said, I mean, he didn't really get into specifics. He just said, I guess he's been banged up this year a little bit. And this was, they felt like the first week he was hundred percent and his best week of practice. And he, he seemed to indicate that that gave him more confidence. It also gave Max Duggan more confidence in using him. So I guess they both. Duggan Johnston and the coaching staff all felt like coming into Saturday. Oh, we're sort of at full strength here and we can exploit this a little bit. And you're absolutely right. It did come through in terms of like his number of targets. I just think this is great. He had 14 catches. No one else on the team had more than two. Like Darius Davis and Tay Barber both had really important catches. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, they both had a touchdown, but like it was very clear, like from the jump that Max was like, Hey, I'm throwing a cue. Y'all can try and stop it. And that was really fun to see. It was something that we had kind of like imagined happening since before the season. And that really does, this offense had obviously not been having any problems or any significant problems before now, but that does really kind of raise the ceiling of what they can do on that side of the ball. Yeah. And a couple of things about that before we move on to the defense. So one, I think this could change now if like they sort of pivot to making Quentin Johnson a feature of the offense, which is fine. But I saw people yesterday and today being like, well, we got to get Darius Davis more touches. And I'll just caution folks. Like there's only so many opportunities in the game and there's this wide receiving core does appear to be deep. So I just feel like probably week to week, you're going to look at the box score and say, Oh man, I would love to see Tay Barber or Gunnar Henderson or, um, like, you know, I don't know what the, and, and I'm not saying anything bad about it. I don't know what the deal is. Blair Conright's like a guy that has been a part of this offense for the past few years, non-existent right now. And, and I don't think that's a commentary on him. I just think there's so many different guys that can get the football. I mean, there's, there's only so many ways you can spread it around. And it's a product of how the other team is playing you as well. I mean, you mm-hmm. can tell that they saw something on film where they felt like, oh, if we can get, they were really trying to get the screen game going for a little while on Saturday. And so I don't know if it was a matter of like, oh, we really like the matchup of our speed on the perimeter, um, which obviously with Davis's touchdown was absolutely, absolutely the right call. Right. But I think to your point, it'll be a matter of like, Hey, what's the matchup week to week and what it, and how is the defense playing you week to week? That will probably dictate a little bit like who's, who's going to be the guy who is the emphasis of the game plan or the emphasis of the in-game adjustments. Um, And that's okay um, because uh, this receiving core, they all have the ability to kind of um, make those big plays and big moments. Tay Barber, one catch on the day, but it was super important. It was a clutch catch. It was a contested catch um, for a touchdown in a key moment. He's capable of doing that. And then he's okay with not having to get the ball Um, 10 other times over the course of the game. Okay. So defensively um, gave up three points in the first half, seemed to do a really good job against Jalen Daniels and sort of this option attack. And then Daniels goes down right before halftime. Jason Bean comes in and KU scores 28 points, being through four touchdown passes. Um, 
let me preface this because there's a, a commenter. His name's Zoom Play. I, sorry, I don't know like your actual name, sir. Um, he he always accuses me about being negative. I'm not really trying to be negative on the defense, but I do think this is concerning. The past defense struggled. Now, Matt, I think we're kind of on the same page here, and I won't expand too much because I'll allow you to do it. I feel like the changing quarterback, Bean seemed to be more of a drop-back passer. That sort of changed the dynamic of the game in a lot of ways. Um, and and to be fair to the defense, Jamoy Hodge had an interception. They forced that fumble by Jalen Daniels. They forced a missed field goal. They got the stop at the end of the game. They got big stops. But the whole point, I mean, one of the points, of, one of the focuses of the Joe Gillespie defense is that you're not supposed to allow these big explosive plays over the top. And there were a lot of those on Saturday. And that's sort of been a theme. So I think some of it is just the nature of the offense that Kansas was running. But there were a lot of guys running free on Saturday, Matt. And that's that's not going to work against, you know, the rest of the schedule, obviously. Yeah, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be fair. I'm gonna be consistent because I said this last week about Oklahoma. Um, we were talking about how, like, oh, Oklahoma's defense, like a lot of the problems that they were having was not a matter of like they don't have the athletes, um, or that they just couldn't match up with TCU. It was blown coverages, it was bad assignments. So I'm gonna be consistent here. Um the problems for TCU on Saturday were not that they didn't have the athletes. They couldn't match up with Kansas. Kansas has some, has some, has some dudes at receiver. Like, let's be really clear. Um, and at the same time, there were also instances where just like guys got lost, like guys got straight up left, like to run downfield open and, and, and Kansas got it, got huge chunk plays out of it. So it's, that's miscommunication. So that's not knowing your assignments. Um, so I think that that absolutely plays into it. Um, that's not good. Those are like fundamental things that you need to fix. Um, and I, I do agree that I think it's one thing when you, when you prep all week for Jalen Daniels, who was at like, you know, you could argue yeah. was best quarterback in the big 12 coming in, coming into this season, uh, coming into this, this week. And so you prep, all week preparing for his style of play. And while he was in the game, to your point, they held him to three points. And then after they make that switch, things change. And I think Gillespie to this point has not seemed super interested in some of this. Uh, we complain, I can, I complain about the pass rush a good bit. I think some of that is just part of Gillespie's style on defense. He's not super interested in like trying to, manufacture a pass rush whether that's with you know extra rushers or whatever and he's not and the three down guys are not it's not most of the time like the primary part of their job is to get after the passer and I think especially with a mobile quarterback like Jalen Daniels they were planning to play more like hey let's just play contain because he actually rates Jalen Daniels does rates super well against throwing against pressure. Um, and then obviously has the ability to escape the pressure and then get chunk plays on the ground as well. So I think they were planning on that. And then Bean comes in and they're still playing that contained style, but then Bean's just like sitting back there in the pocket and your coverage can only hold up for so long um, before um, guys eventually just run free anyway. So I think it was a combination of factors, but yeah, I'm not, I think the secondary is the weakness of the defense right now. I don't think that's a, a, a hot take by any means. And um, that's not ideal <laughs> going into the rest of big 12 play where you are going to face some really talented receivers, some really talented quarterbacks. Um, you know, <laughs> I hate to keep picking on him, but I, I Abe Kamara, like, contains multitudes because he had all sorts of like he had some like huge big hits and game-changing plays on Saturday and he also like got lost a couple times in coverage and like that's I feel like the a, a microcosm of the of the secondary as a whole is just like they have some playmakers back there who can do some cool stuff and they're also just like not all on the same page or knowing their assignments all the time. Yeah, Abe definitely has some splash plays sort of both ways. But, you know, I think he's hanging in there and making some plays and making some things happen. Um, you're right. I'm not super worried. Like some of the free runners and that kind of thing, nobody else in the conference runs an offense like KU. So I realized some of that was schemed up. It's just strange to me 
like the amount of kind of man for man dudes getting beat. That's 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 an issue. Um, and going to the pass rush, let's talk about that. I need to break this down by snap, but you're right. I mean, especially on third and long, it's a lot of three down rushers, eight guys back playing kind of soft zones, trying to keep things in front of you. And I mean, by the very nature of it, when you have three pass rushers, it's three on five, potentially three on six. If the offense is going to leave an extra blocker in there. So the numbers are against you, but I don't know what the balance is between yeah, we got to stay, we got to stay back. We got to not allow these huge plays, but also if you're just letting quarterbacks sit back there, like at what point do you start bringing four five, six guys, at least occasionally to try to speed things up? If you don't, if you don't feel like the secondary can hold up for extended periods of time. Yeah. That, that's a smart thing in terms of at key moments, right? Like pick your spots, right where if it is um if it's third down or if it's you know a a big moment in the game or you're in the red zone like bring pressure from somewhere maybe bring it from somewhere that maybe that you don't bring it from a lot whether that's like a cat blitz um or um you know bringing a safety down or 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 or, or showing something pre-snap and then the pressure comes from somewhere else after um because i agree i think rush three drop eight works well if you've got the personnel to do it what we're seeing thus far is that they might not have the personnel to hold up uh with eight guys back and if that's not working then you might as well bring an extra man or two um you know get the get the quarterback under duress a little bit make it make an errant throw and and save yourself a little bit um on the whole i think the defense has 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 been has has been better than it was last year it's been yes. better against the run on the whole. And I think your point about schematically what Kansas does is important. Um, they're really good at scheming guys open, using preset motion to diagnose what the defense is doing and then reacting to it. And just like, you know, creating havoc in the back end of your defense with like those rub routes and everything. Like they scored a touchdown on one of those scissor out um, things, one of those scissor out plays. Um, and so, you know, that's what, that's what they're trying to do. Um and I agree. I don't think they're going to run into somebody who does anything to that degree later on this season, but you do need to be, um, you do need to not be caught flat footed as often as they were on Saturday. Um, it's year one under Gillespie. You give them a little bit, but again, I'm going to be fair. Um, if I make this, <laughs> if I make this criticism of Oklahoma, I'm going to make it a TCU too. Um, there's some fundamentals. There's some issues with uh, TCU's uh, fundamentals that are a problem, uh, including like, some of those big plays could have been alleviated by like tackling form was not awesome on Saturday, a bunch of guys going, going high rather than going low and a bunch of guys failing to wrap up when they did go high. And that resulted in a lot of yards after contact or yards after the catch um, instances where maybe you could have stopped it short of the chains. And instead you end up with first downs, you end up with chug plays. So again, it's year one under Gillespie, giving it time instilling the culture, installing the system, but like things, things to be watching for. And to your point, like we're nitpicking this team's five and oh the defense is better than it was last year. Um that's not a high bar to clear, but they have cleared it. Um but like things to be watching for. Okay, so let's talk about Marcel Brooks for a second. Because he's been in the lineup now for a couple of weeks and has made some big time plays. And on Saturday there was a series the last series of the game, KU had first and ten well, we'll start. They had second and 10 around like the TC 35 yard line. And they ran a play where everything like they were showing everything was moving to the right. And they just swung Devin Neal out to the left. And I don't know who it was, but there, the TCU safety was having to like fight over the top and get through everybody to try to take him down. And thankfully Jason Bean overthrew him. And so it was an incomplete pass. And on third and 10, they did kind of the same thing to the other side. And it was Marcel Brooks and Devin Neal one-on-one. And Brooks was behind him. I mean, he was like a step behind. But he was able to uh, grab him by the shoulder pad, avoid a a horse collar penalty, and bring him down in the open field. It was a huge play. It set up fourth and nine, and they had a point in the game. Um, 
again, it, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, you got to pick your spots because I know like he's not your prototypical three down linebacker, Matt, but man, you can just tell the athleticism kind of the game changing abilities there. So I'm excited about his potential to, uh, you know, intimidate and make plays against opposing offenses the rest of the year. He is, he's a guy that we've been talking about potential for, for three years now. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just really nice to see him capitalize on it in some key moments. He and Shad Banks, Shad Banks had a couple big plays, including as a kick returner. That's its own thing. We can talk about that. Yeah. Um, but no, Brooks has been, he's made a couple people and it just brings an energy to the field and, and some speed. He might be a guy who is, if you do choose to like bring some, some extra pressure and some blitzes um, in key moments, he could be the guy who does that. Cause he is, he does have that speed. The fact anyone who can run down, Devin Neal in the open field um you want that speed on the field as much as you can as much as you can have it and um you put him out there let him be a heat schemist for the quarterback every once in a while um which is like what he initially came into college was gonna do right he was playing like this weird flex role for LSU where he was rushing the pass or playing some linebacker playing some safety even and um giving him the opportunity to do some of the uh you know some of those like see ball get ball kind of opportunities uh, probably the best use of his of just crazy athleticism yeah for sure and uh it's it's wild to see it kind of come full circle because he has been like he played receiver last year um he was on the field in spurts in 2020 but he's here now and it's it's awesome to see and yeah the shad banks thing is really interesting um I'm not going to criticize it because he had some good returns on Saturday and even the ball he dropped, like at the end of the game, he was able to get out there and just use his size to like barrel some people over and get to like the 25. But I don't know if teams are going to kick away from Darius Davis all the time. I I might want somebody else back there. Like you put Jordan Hudson back there. I feel like you put, um, uh, they, they had a barber, maybe. There. They had to say Barber, you know, I would like to see Major Everhart. I feel like they're trying to save his red shirt, so they might not be start doing that until later on in the year. Um, but Jordan Hudson, I think they have every intention of like playing. Like they're not worried about red shirt and him, so like, he would be my next choice if you're if you're not going to put if 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 you're worried about that because that was something that happened a lot on Saturday. Kansas was like, you know what, screw it. Like we don't care if we take a penalty on every kickoff, we'll kick out of bounds. We're not kicking to Darius or we're going to kick to Shad Banks, which like honestly smart. Um, it's going to be murder on our, um, on our early season prediction on the over under on one and a half uh, kickoff returns for him. Was it oh, one that's and a half? That's true. Yeah. Uh, yeah or one and a half for, for get, get, get Darius. Um, so it's murder on that prediction for us, but it is smart on Kansas' part. But yeah, so I think I love I love Shad. I love I appreciate that he used to uh, play receiver. I I think someone with more prototypical speed and shiftiness in the open field should be the person who is the other person fielding the kicks. That's not Darius Davis. Okay, so uh, final thing here. This is something I never thought I would say. But we're halfway through the season. We will we'll be halfway through the season after the Oklahoma State game. Matt Max Duggan is like a legitimate Heisman candidate. I mean, he's he's in the mix. And his numbers weren't eye popping by like today's college football standards, uh, Saturday against Kansas, but he was still really, really good and made huge plays. Um, I mean, I keep waiting. It's so strange. I've said this a couple times, like this offense, they're going to have a game or two this season where they're going to have to grind it out and it just doesn't click like you would expect. But on Saturday, they didn't really play well for two and a half quarters and they still scored 38 points. I mean, they just have a way of sort of finding their footing and, and scoring, you know, multiple touchdowns on consecutive possessions. So he's, he's right there. And um, the, the leap for him in year one has really just been astounding with, uh, with the new coaching staff. The 
first off, I think we need to address kind of what we talked about a couple weeks ago, which is I don't think this job is coming back to Chandler Morris at any point. No, <laughs> like, I, I don't see Duggan, it, man. Not this, this point. Now. Duggan's job now, which is wild. Like when um, when Duggan put forth his effort after the SMU game, and Sonny had his comments about like how proud he was of Max and how indebted he was to him, and it's oh, that's how your son, how you want your son to handle it. Like I, I said at the time, I was like, this reads to me like somebody who's just like being very appreciative of the of the kind of player they've been given not necessarily the not necessarily the exact player that they wanted right i think that's out the window now i mean you were you're riding with him until uh until it gets shown definitively that he can't handle running this offense which he's done a phenomenal job he really has he's done a phenomenal job to this point i mean we keep harping on it but his accuracy has been so much better his ball placement's been better. He's been making good decisions. He's still, I can legitimately remember like one truly turnover worthy throw that he's had this season. Even the interception on Saturday was a jump ball between Quentin Johnson and the Kansas safety. And you know, the, the, the color commentator noted it. Like it seemed like Quentin didn't even know the safety was there. Um, mm-hmm. And if he had, then maybe he goes up and it's a pass breakup, but it's like an arm punt at the end of the first half. Like I yeah. don't really count that. So really the only like truly turnover worthy throw that I can remember him throwing this season off the top of my head is, um, is the throw in the flat um, against Oklahoma last week, which he gets bailed by Quentin who wrestles the ball away from the, or the ball gets hit by, by the Oklahoma defender. And, and Quentin makes a really nice grab off the, off the deflection and they, and they get some yards out of it. So he's been all that to say, he's been very judicious with the ball. He's made good decisions. He has had, uh, he's been so much more accurate and he's put, and he's putting his, stable of his very deep stable of talented receivers in position to make plays and 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 um and make big plays and score touchdowns which is just again just really nice to see after the last four years so very impressed by him he's uh, this is gonna be my shtick this is gonna be my meme every week I'm, I'm just gonna keep listing off max duggan's um fbs ranks among quarterbacks every week until they get bad where they're not worth listing anymore he's second in the country in pass efficiency he's second in the country in yards per attempt he's fifth in total qbr he's sixth in completion percentage and among quarterbacks he's eighth in yards per carry which is obviously such a huge part of his game they didn't really utilize him as much of a run as as much as a runner um Mm -hmm. against kansas i think kansas saw what happened against oklahoma and was trying to to play against that i also think the offensive line's blocking wasn't as great uh yeah it wasn't great (laughs) Um, but he's just been such, I think, I don't, I don't think he's going to win the Heisman. Um, but he absolutely, uh, deserves to be like in the conversation on the power rankings in the straw polls. Um, if, for and part of the reason you hear me and other TCU folks, like just waxing poetic about is, is it's so night and day from what he was even just a year ago. And that's the thing that's wild and it's a testament to Sandy Dykes and Garrett Riley and this coaching staff for getting that out of him especially on the fly when they weren't planning on him being the starter at the beginning of the yep. year. it's really incredible yeah it's been special man and uh, I hope they can keep it going Oklahoma State in the Carter this weekend um, TCU's number 13 in the AP poll number 15 in the coaches poll Oklahoma State's a top 10 team and if they win this game, then, I mean, you can start talking seriously about being a Big 12 title contender, which is definitely not something I thought I would say before the start of the season, but um, they keep getting it done. So TCU's 5-0. and We'll have coverage all week long leading up to this Oklahoma State game. I'm Stephen Simcox. Matt Jennings is with us. You're listening to Lockdown Horn Frogs, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. It's your team every day.